Welcome to this Future Earth webinar. I'm Tony Capon from Monash Sustainable Development Institute in Australia, and I'm the co-chair of the Future Earth Health Knowledge Action Network with uh, uh, Chris Eby from the University of Washington in the USA. More on Future Earth later. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands uh, we're assembling on. Uh, today, I'm on Wurundjeri country, uh, people of the Kulin Nation in Melbourne, Australia. And we acknowledge indigenous people uh, wherever we're assembling around the world today. This webinar is about research priorities in the field of planetary health. In recent years, the health impacts of extreme events have arrested our attention around the world. Who can forget the devastation from Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines in 2013? More than 6,000 people died in that typhoon and more than 6 million people were displaced. Just last year here in Australia, we faced extreme wildfires and severe smoke pollution for many months. You'll likely remember the media images uh, broadcast around the world from those devastating fires. In recent years, wildfires have also raged in other places around the world, in Europe, Greece and Russia in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, Brazil, Argentina and elsewhere, in Canada and the US. And now in 2020 and 2021, we're confronting the global COVID-19 pandemic. Novel infectious agents like the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes at COVID-19 disease emerge in the context of social and environmental change. Other examples include HIV, SARS, Ebola and Zika. Climate change, forest loss, urbanization, a broader agri-food system transitions are providing new opportunities for the spillover of these novel pathogens from wild animals through domestic animals to people. These wildfires and pandemics are symptoms of the Anthropocene. They're signs that the way we live is out of balance with nature. Notably though, it's not just about these extreme events and emergencies. Social and environmental change affects health in many ways. And it follows that rethinking our patterns of development, embracing sustainable development and delivering on the SDGs will safeguard the well-being of people and planet for current and future generations. The research priorities we're presenting today were identified through a collaborative process among a global and multidisciplinary network called the Future Earth Health Knowledge Action Network. Uh, for shorthand, we call it the Health Can. And Josh Tewksbury will tell us more about Future Earth in a moment. In the next slide, I'd like, uh, I which shows a picture from um, uh, a workshop uh, in Taipei in 2019. And I'd like to make a shout out to Taiwan's Academy of Seneca for generously hosting this workshop uh, that helped shape these research priorities we're presenting today. And the ongoing support of Academy of Seneca in the work of the Health Can is greatly appreciated. In the next slide, uh, you'll see the framework uh, for the research priorities that we're presenting today. Uh, 
at the top processes affecting uh, human and environmental health. On the left hand side, a range of socioeconomic transitions, economic, demographic, social, urban and energy. On the right side, global environmental changes, climate change, land use change, uh, food system changes, uh, biodiversity loss, ocean system changes, pollution and water system changes. And then the research agenda uh, at the bottom that we'll be walking you through uh, in this session. Mm -hmm. In this final slide, um, uh, the order of proceedings for today, uh, we'll hear from a number of speakers and this will be followed uh, by a Q&A segment and then closing remarks um, from my co-chair, Chris Eby. Please feel free to paste questions in the chat box as we go, or you're welcome to also keep them uh, uh, till the end of the session. Uh, do refrain from sending links uh, in the chat box uh, uh, if possible. So now it's over to Josh Chooksbury, the Executive Director of Future Earth, uh, to get us started in the webinar. Over to you, Josh. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate it very much. And hello, everyone. I am delighted to be with you to help kick off this important conversation. You're going to hear from an exceptional lineup of speakers in the next 50 minutes, but I'd like to get things started by giving just a bit of background about Future Earth and about the Health Knowledge Action Network within Future Earth. Simply put, Future Earth is the largest network of sustainability researchers in the world. We work with leading thinkers in all sectors of society in all parts of the world to advance research in support of transformations to sustainability. All of the speakers you will hear from today are doing this work. The, the vision at Future Earth is a sustainable and equitable world founded on openly accessible and shared knowledge. And achieving that vision requires mission-driven work. We focus on building structures that will increase the role of science and sustainability decision-making, supporting the development of high impact strategic research and synthesis and connecting the knowledge that comes from this work to policy and practice at national, international and global scales. And the most powerful way we have found to do this work is through the development and support of knowledge action networks. And the Health Knowledge Action Network has been leading the way for others in this space. Each each Knowledge Action Network in Future Earth was developed to bring together the very best minds from across disciplines, sectors, and geographies to focus knowledge and action on, critical, on a critical sustainability challenge, and to do that in an integrated way, using transdisciplinary approaches. There is no challenge more important to the people of this planet than planetary health. And after an initial development phase, the Health Knowledge Action Network launched in Taipei almost two years ago, focused on a fundamental truth. The health of people around the world is tightly linked to the health of the places they inhabit. Over the last year, this truth has found new meaning, of course, with the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. This virus has not only shown us the deadly consequences of our deteriorating relationship with nature, but it has also re revealed how unprepared our societies and institutions are for the realities of an increasingly interconnected world undergoing unprecedented environmental change. In the early stages of the pandemic, the Health Knowledge Action Network quickly mobilized to provide governments, institutions, and individuals with the most up-to-date science and policy recommendations. This was truly pushing, pushing the community together and putting out results in a rapid fashion that were used around the world. On Earth Day 2020, members of the Health Knowledge Action Network also organized one of Future Earth's most successful webinars to date, exploring crucial insights into the growing risk of hotspots for zoonotic diseases and the disproportionate impact of the virus on vulnerable populations. We're also learning about how health is a critical yet often overlooked aspect of other sustainability crises. Within climate change, for example, the growing mental health burden resulting from a changing climate made our list for the 10 new insights in climate science for 2020. And this is due in large part to the leadership of the Health Knowledge Action Network members. Since its inception, the Health Knowledge Action Network has been hard at work identifying scientific knowledge gaps in the sustainability agenda, focused on human and planetary health. And today we're going to explore the fruition of these efforts, a compass to orient important work within science and policy to ensure healthier ecosystems and healthier human communities. In this strange 
temporal fog of life under COVID, it can be easy to forget that we are moving quickly towards 2030 with precious few years left to meet the sustainable development goals. And this makes the work of the Health Knowledge Action Network that much more critical. I'm proud to help introduce this important agenda setting work on behalf of the many contributing authors. Given, and given that it's quickly approaching midnight here in the US, I'm gonna give the floor back to my colleagues, but I would like to first extend my thanks to all those involved in this effort for all that you are helping to drive this critical agenda forward. Thank you very much. Great, well, uh, thanks very much for that introduction, Josh. That's very helpful context indeed. And uh, next we're going to hear uh, from uh, Sir Andy Haynes uh, from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, Andy was the co-chair of the development team uh, for the Health Can. He co-chaired that process with Peter Dashak uh, from the EcoHealth Alliance. And uh, while Andy couldn't be with us today, he has prepared a video presentation uh, that we'll show you now. Thank you very much for asking me to, to speak at this webinar. It's a great pleasure for me to, to say a few words about the importance of research for uh, policy making and policy implementation in, in particular, bringing a transdisciplinary uh, perspective, of course, to the research agenda, because no single discipline can supply all the methodological insights that are required for policy uh, relevant research to improve our understanding of the links between health and the environment, and very importantly, of course, uh, to guide policy and practice. So um, some years ago, the Rockefeller Lancet Commission on Planetary Health outlined three major challenges that needed to be addressed in order to tackle the problems of the Anthropocene epoch, the epoch that we live in, which is characterized by these dramatic changes of the global environment of course, uh, tr triggered by human uh, activities. So these three broad challenges were the imagination challenge, um, or you could call it conceptual challenge, uh, knowledge challenges and implementation challenges. So let me give you an example of conceptual challenges. Well, one of them is the fact that we tend to focus or policymakers tend to focus very much on GDP, gross domestic product as an indicator of human progress. So much of the political discourse focuses on the need to increase gross domestic product, stimulate economic growth. But of course, the GDP has very um, direct, indirect and rather weak relationships with key human health metrics, for example, and also with environmental metrics. And indeed, in many cases, high GDP is associated with high levels of uh, global um, environmental degradation, high mass gas emissions, for example. So that's a, that's a challenge, is reframing uh, our conceptual thinking to focus very much on how we can sustain human health within the planetary boundaries that we know we have to live within. The second uh, challenge is the knowledge challenge. And of course, we do generate a, a vast amount of knowledge, certainly in the health field, we have uh, very large amounts of biomedical knowledge around molecular biology, genetics, and so on, um, epigenetics increasingly. Um, but we do lack a lot of the knowledge that we need, the transdisciplinary knowledge that we need in order to understand the complex linkages between environmental change and human health, and most importantly, of course, what to do about it. But even when we have um, the, the knowledge, we often don't put that knowledge into policy and practice. So there's a major challenge around implementation, the implementation gap. And I'll refer to that uh, briefly later on. So in order to safeguard human health and to safeguard the environment in the Anthropocene epoch, we need to address all these three groups of challenges simultaneously. So what do we know about global environmental change and health? Well, obviously I can't summarize it all, but this slide attempts to illustrate how the different planetary boundaries uh, shown here, climate change, ocean acidification, biosphere and others that are listed on the slide, they are the finite boundaries within which humanity can flourish. And we know that we are pushing at the limits of some of those boundaries, uh, climate change, for example, biosphere integrity, 
biogeochemical flows. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> for others, we don't have a clear measure of, of the boundary. So there are major linkages between these planetary boundaries and human health. Many of them are still being, uh, um, still yet to be fully understood. But it's very clear that human health does depend on the state of the natural systems uh, of our planet. And of course, the, uh, these systems, these natural systems, affect health through a range of different pathways. They affect non-communicable diseases. For example, air pollution is a major trigger for heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and other conditions. Infectious diseases through land use change or climate change. Malnutrition in all its forms. Some undernutrition, of course, is a result of um, climate change and other factors. And mental health is also, of course, extremely important. And we can see it being affected by natural, uh, increasing levels of so-called natural disasters, uh, major climatic events, and so on. Mental health, uh, have, they have a big effect um, on mental health. So there are many pathways by which these uh, global environmental changes and the planetary boundaries more generally can impact on, on human health. And uh, these can be divided into three broad categories, the very direct effects, those of heat, for example, extreme events, climate events, those mediated through ecosystems, such as emerging infections, um, su such as COVID, of course, vector-borne diseases, waterborne diseases and of course food supply and undernutrition. And then the socially mediated effects such as increasing poverty, migration, population displacement and probably conflict as well. So uh, these uh, planetary level changes manifest as local changes uh, in the environment which then trigger changes in human health. So against this background, um, the health development uh, team for the CAN some years ago was tasked with uh, the, the uh, had the role of setting up the CAN. And in doing so, they outlined and scoped out a number of potential uh, areas for the CAN to be involved in. First of all, of course, the establishment of the health CAN development community, and that's now well underway. Setting research priorities, which is very much what you're talking about at the moment, uh, linking environment and, he uh, and health, uh, and perhaps using those, the outputs of those uh, research uh, initiatives to develop transdisciplinary briefs that could inform policy decisions. To build a list of relevant data sets for health and the environment and analyze the opportunities and limitations of these data sets for filling the kind of gaps in our knowledge to build a repository of systematic reviews, because we know that single studies, of course, are not sufficient. We have to systematically review the evidence across a range of different fields and linking environment and health. And that's a, a task which has still not yet been done, but there are a growing number of relevant systematic reviews. And then construct system maps and pathways to help to elucidate these different linkages between health uh, through mechanisms such as food systems, through cities, using case studies of successes and failures. And finally, integrating health into global change models and scenarios so that we can get better projections of the likely effects of environmental change on health. What do we know about the research um, activities so far? Well, this is a recent work that's still um, being, being submitted for, for publication, but it's um, a mapping of climate and health studies, climate change and health. So it's not across the whole planetary health agenda, it's particularly focusing on climate change. Those published since 2013, since the IPCC, the last IPCC report. And um, <clears throat> what it shows is that uh, there are about 13,000 or so studies in the literature, mostly concentrated around Europe, uh, Asia and North America relatively few in Africa, Latin America, uh, Central Asia, and so on. The majority of these studies are looking at the impacts of climate change on human health. They're often very short-term studies. They don't give us long-term trends. They're often of single events or a few events. So they give us limited information. And uh, only a small proportion of them are actually related to implementing policies or evaluating policies or interventions which can help to reduce the impacts of environmental change. About 10% on mitigation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, many of them from China, 
on the air pollution co-benefits from mitigation and about 7% on adaptation or resilience, how we create more resilient health systems or more resilient societies. Um, so there's a real task then in building up the um, evidence base, particularly to help uh, support evidence-based decision-making. And, uh, and what we could say very simply that there are two broad types of areas around the world where we can collect data, hotspot sites where there are impacts of multiple environmental changes, not just climate change, but obviously other environmental changes that we've talked about briefly. So actually to elucidate what's happening on the ground as these environmental changes are impacting uh, vulnerable populations. We know that diseases are shifting, for example. Uh, we know that there's air pollution from wildfires. We know that uh, biodiversity is being lost at an unprecedented rate. But we often don't fully understand the complex interactions of these different factors and their implications for human health. But on the other side of the coin, there's also an opportunity to collect data for what we might call opportunity sites. In other words, sites where solutions such as adaptation strategies or resilience, uh, strategies to promote resilience, but also to reduce the environmental footprint of societies where they're being implemented. And there are some good examples of those in cities, for example, where a number of mayors are pursuing strategies to decarbonize their local economy and put them, their local economy in a much more sustainable footing. So research can contribute to the transformation needed for sustainability in a number of ways. It can help to identify key tipping points for rapid social change. For example, using the health argument, the, 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 the argument that health can be improved, health can be protected by the interventions as a motivator for increasing their rate of uptake. To evaluate the opportunities, the benefits, including the economic valuation of those benefits and the trade-offs of change. It's important to recognize that in many cases there are trade-offs. So for example, if we burn more biofuels and we grow more, spend, convert more land into grow biofuels, then that sets up a competition with food and can increase food prices, just to give one example. So science research has an important role in accelerating the uptake of policies, technologies and interventions to reduce the environmental footprint of societies, but also to improve health. And there are a number of cross-cutting issues, the need to set up better surveillance and monitoring systems. We still don't have reliable systems which link environmental change and human health. There's a really important role for research in detecting and attributing the health effects of different environmental changes. Um, and we still um, lack rigorous research studies that would allow us to detect and attribute appropriate, appropriately the health impacts to different environmental changes, including uh, climate change, uh, land use, and other changes. And then we need to use some of the uh, data and evidence that we have to populate models and scenarios to describe future vulnerabilities under a range of climate and development futures, um, and also, of course, to model the potential impact of policy uh, options. Systematic reviews I've mentioned, increasingly it's becoming difficult to do that by hand because the volume of literature is so large. And so increasingly we and others are looking at machine learning, artificial intelligence approaches to help speed up systematic reviews. And finally, of course, implement implementation science often neglected, but a really important area for researchers looking at the effective bridging of science and policy through co-design, and co-implementation of potential solutions. So one of the things we need to do in terms of improving these data linkages is to build what we might call a planetary health watch system through transdisciplinary stakeholder engagement to detect early impacts and predict, predict future impacts of environmental change, to quantify these impacts and vulnerabilities, to uh, strengthen transdisciplinary research between environmental change, health and social science communities, to design and target interventions more effectively, and to measure the effectiveness of adaptation and mitigation policies. And finally, and very importantly, of course, to inform policymakers and the public, particularly um, helping to make decision makers more accountable and helping them to base their decisions uh, on more rigorous evidence. And this is just one example of a uh, 
of a tremendous resource, which is the World Resources Institute Resource Watch, which is an open access um, portal, which has 200 open access data sets on it. Very, virtually none really on health as such, but we have been working with them um, over the last couple of years to make the case that we need to build much closer linkages between many of the data sets that they have on their portal and some of the human health data sets. And I think if we can do that, uh, then we'll be uh, a very long, uh, we'll launch the research agenda very substantially. So in conclusion, let me say that it's a very exciting, very challenging time, of course, for um, health and environmental research. There are tremendous opportunities now to work together uh, through Future Earth to uh, really employ the instruments of science, but in very much in co-design and collaboration with decision makers, with communities, with those who must implement this knowledge. And in doing so, um, we aspire to catalyze um, a much more um, dramatic change uh, in uh, our societal structures, in our energy use, in our sustainability than we've seen so far. Because I think, uh, as we're all agreed, we need a dramatic transformation of our energy systems, food systems, transport systems, and health systems, if we are to navigate our way through the Anthropocene. And there is a real opportunity now for science working with policymakers, those who must implement the findings of research to accelerate the sustainability transformation. We, knew that, we know that we have to live in a very different way if we want to secure the health of the growing human population within planetary boundaries. We have to achieve high levels of human development at much lower levels of environmental impact than we have today. In the near term, of course, the Sustainable Development Goals provide um, goals, targets, indicators, which will help to put us on the road to transformation. And of course, by 2030, if we can achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, then that will place, place us in a much better position to achieve our ultimate goal of a sustainable, uh, healthy world population within these finite planetary boundaries. Although only one of the Sustainable Development Goals specifically focuses on health, SDG 3, that focuses, of course, on largely on universal health coverage, uh, some extent on air pollution as well. But many of the other goals are, are highly relevant to health. So SDG 1 on poverty, of course, SDG 2 on sustainable food systems, um, this SDG 7 on sustainable energy, 11 on cities, sustainable cities, and of course 13 on climate change itself. So many of them are linked to health. And without achieving a range of these other sustainable development goals, we cannot move societies towards a healthier, more sustainable future. So the SDGs are a kind of uh, milestone, if you like, towards the kind of world economy that we need to see. But we need to accelerate beyond the SDGs and have higher aspirations than those included in the SDGs towards a truly transformational approach which will enable us to achieve human health at zero greenhouse gas emissions, net zero emissions, as we now know by, by mid-century, but also uh, rapidly cutting biodiversity loss, uh, preventing uh, damaging land use change and reversing that as far as possible, stopping the depletion of, of fresh water and the accumulation of, of pollutants um, in the environment, to name but a few. So there's now a tremendous opportunity, I think, for researchers working with decision makers to really carve out uh, a new agenda of transdisciplinary research, very much focusing on the kind of solutions that we need in order to sustain human health and the natural systems of our planet in the Anthropocene Epoch. Thank you very much. Well, terrific uh, to have that presentation uh, from Andy Haynes today. And as I said, uh, Andy was the co-chair of the Health Can Development Team with uh,
Peter Dashak um, from the Eco Health Alliance, and and uh, you know he was uh, making the case there for for the kind of research um, uh, that we're proposing uh, for the health can that uh, transdisciplinary research, um, transcending uh, academic disciplines and valuing uh, the know-how of people in policy and practice and indeed indigenous people so that we are um, you know genuinely uh, uh, co-producing knowledge so our next presenter is uh, Francis Harris um, from the University of Hertfordshire in uh, the UK over to you Francis to tell us about uh, a perspective from uh, global environmental changes thank you Tony um, can I have the first slide please so in the work that the Future Health Can, Health Can has done, we identified five processes of socioeconomic transition and seven processes of global environmental change that impact human and planetary health. And these were shown initially in a slide by Tony um, a little bit earlier this morning. So I want to focus particularly on the seven processes of global environmental change. Although presented as individual research topics, we recognize that these are not discrete, but rather interconnected topics with potentially synergistic linkages. So I'm going to speak about those now individually, and then I will go on to talk about the interconnections between them. Next slide, please. So firstly, climate change. The increasing frequency and intensity of extreme weather events means that around 90% of disasters are weather or climate related. This causes displacement and sometimes conflict with consequent social, economic and political impacts. Climate change has also been linked to increased respiratory diseases, foodborne diseases, water and vector-borne diseases. Overall, climate change is impacting on economic growth, resulting in increased poverty. The conversion of primary forest to agricultural land results in significant amounts of land use change. The demands to convert more primary forest can be exacerbated if agricultural land is poorly managed or becomes degraded. So 75% of global land cover is anthropogenically degraded and such extensive land use change is impacting on a range of ecosystem services, often services which were only appreciated once we realised they were being lost, such as pollination. And for another example, deforestation has led to the loss of key ecosystem services such as carbon storage and sequestration, biodiversity, water and regulation of climate and diseases. There are growing concerns about the impacts of land use change on the relationships between humans, animals and microbial processes, and in particular, the consequences of this for zoonotic disease. Around 31% of zoonotic infectious diseases have emerged since 1940 and are associated with um, some types of land conversion, including fragmentation, agricultural intensification, deforestation, and this of course leads to millions of deaths and substantial loss of global labour productivity. So on this current slide, looking at um, uh, issues around food security, we know that despite years of research and effort, hunger remains one of the global grand challenges of the 21st century. Well over 800 million people, that's one in nine, live in hunger, and more than two billion lack safe, nutritious and sufficient food. This is a particular issue in low and middle income countries and things like stunting. Um, sorry, uh, globally, we face opposing challenges of both food shortages and overeating. So stunting, particularly in the under fives, remains a major problem while at the same time, the diseases resulting from being overweight, such as obesity and diabetes, are also presenting a global health burden. The nutrition transition, which involves a change in dietary intake towards greater meat and dairy products, 
combined with societal changes which result in a more sedentary population and workforce are adding to food and related health burdens. Furthermore, the changes in agricultural systems to support that dietary change are, is driving further environmental impacts. Climate change is effect, predicted to affect crop yields, as well as pests and pathogens of both crops and livestock, and this will impact on food security through event impacts on yields and on food prices. Globally, Despite an abundance of biodiversity, our food systems rely on relatively narrow range of plants and animals, and within that, a relatively narrow gene pool. In the last 100 years, more than 90% of crop varieties were lost in favor of genetically improved high yielding varieties. And we also rely on biodiversity for medicines, many of which are, are derived from uh, plants, even if they are then later synthesized in a laboratory. Um, natural processes have provided forms of biological control of pests and diseases, but there's now growing concerns about host pathogen interactions and the spread of diseases. Um, and there are also concerns about the spread of invasive species and impacts on ecologies and environment. So moving on to this next slide here, ocean covers 71% of the Earth's surface and helps regulate climate and moderates the risk of climate change. It provides food, it provides employment, um, it provides energy and is a source of um, uh, some medicines as well. 90% of ocean fish stocks are either over or fully fished and do not have the capacity to provide the recommended level of fish for healthy diets which of course impacts on food insecurity and undernutrition. Furthermore, the ocean faces the twin challenges of acidification um, due to carbon emissions and marine pollution with the consequent impact on marine biodiversity. 80% of marine pollution comes from land, um, including untreated wastewater and industrial waste. The implications for health include disease transmission and ingestion of toxic substances, and potentially also issues around seafood insecurity. Air pollution, whether from indoor or outdoor um, environments, has been identified as the single largest health risk, accounting for about 7 million deaths each year. The burning of biomass and fossil fuels both contribute to this. Biomass fuel used by approximately 3 million people has a disproportionate impact on women and children. And the pollutants vary in terms of their chemical composition and their particle size. And climate change can impact on both the form and dispersal of these pollutants. It's estimated that by 2025, 50% of people will be living in water scarce areas. 2 billion people use a drinking water source that's contaminated with feces from improper sanitation. Contaminated drinking water is estimated to cause about half a million diarrheal deaths per year. And currently 844 million people lack basic um, drinking water services. Higher temperatures and the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, particularly flooding, will impact on water quality and the effectiveness of sanitation systems. The challenges surrounding sanitation systems are particularly notable in less developed countries and of course are a priority for rapidly expanding urban areas. Concerns relate to both chemical and microbial contaminants and water and sanitation can further impact on food production and safety and health and have particular implications for groups such as refugees. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. These short summaries do not do justice to the enormity of the issues. And I do recommend that you read the wider paper that we've um, written um, for the further details backing up those short summaries. But considered all together, these seven areas of environmental change are a daunting challenge. And further, as I suggested at the beginning of this presentation, these individual seven global challenges do not exist in isolation. And so there are overall um, interactions between them and the overall challenges are greater than the sum of the parts. 
Some of these interrelations are indicated in this final slide. However, there's also a further dimension to all of this, and that is the social and economic transitions, which have the potential to drive these different changes. Mm -hmm. So I'll now hand over to Ch Chadia and she'll discuss this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Francis. Um, uh, I'm very glad to be with you. I'm Shadi Onus. Uh, I'm part of the development team of the Health Can and uh, currently a member of its steering committee. So I will walk you through the socioeconomic transitions uh, that we uh, addressed in our paper and that informed our uh, research uh, agenda for climate change and health. Uh, so the socioeconomic changes affect human health and well-being. They are the processes that frame and shape our relationship uh, with our environment and how this uh, impact on our health. They include how our societies are organized uh, themselves and how they function, how we use our natural resources and how we manage our health and water and sanitation. So the uh, five socioeconomic transition that we identified as a team, they are the economic, the demographic and social transition, the urbanization transition and the energy use transition. Uh, next, please. Next, please. So we'll start with the economic transition. Of course, the economic growth is associated with the increased income, and this brought fundamental changes to our societies, in particularly increasing the living uh, uh, standards, uh, the high uh, uh, life expectancy rate, uh, the health status also improved, and uh, some poverty alleviations and health care uh, to, uh, but to a small uh, percentage of the population as uh, we will see later in the presentation. However, the economic growth also brought uh, uh, environmental degradations. Sorry, can you go back? Uh, yes. The economic growth also brought uh, environmental degradation and this adversely impacted our uh, population health. And the economic transition uh, varied uh, tremendously uh, across time and across uh, countries and even within countries. In this uh, graph here uh, at your uh, right hand side, you see that we still have large proportion of uh, uh, people living under the poverty line uh, in many parts of the world. Um, the economic growth also, um, uh, yes. Uh, broad concern for equity and uh, equality within and across countries. And this in inequality can lead to uh, erosion of health system and environmental and labor laws and regulations. So this conventional belief that if we have a uh, high GDP, we will have high quality uh, health and uh, educational services as uh, uh, Andy said in his presentation, uh, this is uh, this uh, conventional belief was challenged, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, slide here shows the uh, population living in multidimensional uh, uh, poverty, which uh, include, in addition to low income, uh, uh, low access uh, to healthcare, low educational status, uh, and also. Um, uh, 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 other means uh, like food security and uh, nutrition. So this uh, brought an, uh, tremendous uh, uh, challenges uh, to uh, our uh, health uh, uh, and uh, well-being. Next. Uh, next is our uh, demographic transition. And in this demographic transition, we have seen that, uh, uh, of course, we have a drop in mortality, uh, especially in uh, child mortality, and we have a drop in fertility as well. And this brought uh, better chances uh, for education uh, and for health uh, for a uh, 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 large uh, proportion of the populations. Uh, we have seen investment in education and in health, but this uh, uh, also uh, con uh, shadowed by the concern of equity and inequality in, in access. So uh, uh, the enhancement was seen by small uh, populations, uh, uh, mainly uh, benefited from better nutrition and lower disease rate uh, from their uh, decline in fertility and uh, uh, mortality. 
Next. Next slide. Yes, the energy transition. Um, in, in this one, we uh, we acknowledge that despite the positive consequences for the energy use for our human development. However, the strategy that we used, we rely on fossil fuel, uh, mainly uh, has brought us to the Anthropocene. We have a massive combustion of fossil fuel created a host of negative health, environmental, social, and economic outcomes. Um, uh, and also uh, we have uh, seen that uh, uh, this impacted on our climate uh, change uh, in addition to releasing uh, a lot of uh, harmful uh, pollutant and toxin uh, into the atmosphere. Um, um, in terms of uh, energy, uh, we, are, we have also a lot of inequality. So for people without access to modern energy sources, cooking and lighting fuel, they cost a, a large portion of their income and they drive them into poverty and they limit their opportunities for development. The Paris Agreement that was adopted in 2015 committed the, the signatory to um, uh, expand the use of renewable energy and to uh, make this transition from fossil fuel to uh, clean and affordable energy. Uh, and this will, uh, this will bring uh, a lot of immediate health benefit uh, if we uh, work on mitigation. And the cost of this uh, uh, the magnitude of the health benefit are, is of the same order as the cost of the mitigation. So we have a cost effectiveness uh, uh, approach uh, and imperative uh, to work on energy transition to more clean uh, energy. Next. However, we need innovation uh, to, to make this move uh, and the, uh, this transition in energy use. Uh, but as you can see in this slide, from 1990 to 2015, uh, the share of the uh, uh, renewable energy from our total final energy consumptions, it uh, stands still at uh, 20%. So if we are to uh, achieve uh, uh, SDG 7, and we have to work harder uh, uh, on, on this, and uh, we have to uh, also uh, think of the innovation uh, that can uh, at the same time reduce uh, the disease burden uh, on our population. Next. Uh, we come to the urbanization challenge. Um, Today, we have uh, around 50% of our global population, they live in cities. And this uh, uh, figure uh, jumped from 5% in uh, 200 years ago only. Uh, and we expect that by 2050, this figure will jump also to 70%. 90% uh, of this increase uh, living in the city or urbanization challenge will happen in Asia and in Africa. We know that cities, they are responsible for 85% of global economic activities, so they are very important to our economic growth, but they are at the same time responsible for 75% of greenhouse gas emission. So uh, uh, they, ha uh, they have impact uh, on our health and well-being, and this is very widely between countries and between cities. It depends on the status, on our wealth, on our urban environment, and how they are built. In high-income country, we see that urban health threat they include air and water pollutions, noise, access, uh, less uh, access to green spaces, and in some cases, uh, social exclusion and poverty. In low-income countries, this, in addition to these challenges, we have the issue of the shortages and the decay of infrastructure and inadequate housing and uh, food and nutrition insecurity, and in some cases, poor governance. UN Habitat has documented that only 15% of low-income countries, they report success in using land use planning and urban development to reduce the risk uh, for, for their population living in uh, urban cities. We know that 90% of all urban centers, they are located in Please go back, sorry. Uh, yeah, 
90% of our uh, urban centers, they are located in the coastal areas, which mean that they are facing challenges uh, related to natural disaster and natural hazards, including storm, floods, and hurricane. But we have an opportunity. We have 60% of our urban uh, cities are yet to be built. So we, we need to work more uh, on thinking of our urban development that enhance uh, the urban resilience to climate change and disaster risk. Next. We know that climate change further uh, complicate the urbanization challenge. And uh, we estimate that by 2030, climate change will push more millions of people into poverty uh, in urban, from the urban residents. And we have this uh, phenomena of urban hair, uh, heat islands that will intensify with the climate change. But the built environment can be a mediating factor in this. If we work more on uh, adaptation in the cities, we have more green spaces uh, that can reduce uh, the uh, heat uh, effect on the population. Uh, we have also other uh, effective, um, effective intervention that can be used in the cities uh, to reduce uh, the heat uh, islands. But the important uh, uh, aspect here is that we need a research to understand this vulnerability in the cities and to understand the likely effectiveness of the interventions uh, to build the resilience uh, for acute and uh, chronic uh, stressor. Next. So in conclusion for this session on the socioeconomic transition, that we project that this transition over the next uh, three decades, uh, they need a lot of research and this research should be multidimensional to uh, uh, um, understand the complexity of these processes and how uh, they impact on our health and our societies. We need countries to identify implement and institutionalize enabling conditions uh, that reduce uh, greenhouse gas emission and provide energy for, su for sustainable uh, production and consumption. But this transformative change uh, is needed to address climate change and biodiversity loss so, so as uh, to, uh, we can achieve healthy and sustainable future. Thank you. Great. Uh, oh, thanks uh, very much, Charlie and Francis, for those two perspectives. Um, and now uh, it's over to Brahma Kone from uh, University Palaforo Con Kulabali in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. So over uh, to you, Brahma, to draw the threads together. Thank you so much, uh, Tony. Uh, coming from the main global environmental changes and the transition, socioeconomic transitions that my colleagues just pointed out, the health can comes out with specific tapping points to focus on for attending the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And those research priorities are embedded in four specific silos that are interconnected with planetary health and among themselves. The first one being risk identification and management, and the last one being risk communication. And from risk identification and management to risk communication, we go through strengthening climate resilient health systems, monitoring, surveillance, and learning. Next, please. For risk identification management, four research topics are prevailing that are linked to water, hygiene, sanitation, and waste management for the first one, food production and consumption for the second one, oceans for the third one, and the last one being related to extreme weather events and climate change. 
the main research gaps. Previous one, please, not, not yet the next. The main research gaps, we comes out related to water hygiene, sanitation, and waste management are the need for a redesign of sanitation infrastructure adapted to water shortage and or overflow due to environmental and climate change. We also need urgent research on equitable access to toilet and sanitation facilities for all. We need a paradigm shift from waste being disposed of for a way of resource recovery and reuse. And we finally need key actions and knowledge to reduce climate risk on sanitation and water resources. While looking specifically at food production and consumptions, from the health can perspective, we think research is needed on the role of rising atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide, climate change, climate change, and changing that on the magnitude and patterns of food insecurity. Also on solution to, on solution to address reduction in food quality from higher carbon dioxide concentration and food safety from the increasingly industrialized production practice. We may also need to understand the various characteristic drivers and impact of dietary preference change and transition across geographies, cultures, and level of economic development and urbanization. And we finally certainly need policy option and practical solution needs to foster sustainable dietary transition. When we look specifically to oceans and the stress on oceans, given the continued dispersal of pollutants into the oceans, we think that we need continued lack of, we need an urgency that social policy researchers investigate how global governance can be improved. And continued research is required to increase aquaculture and mariculture production in a way that is sustainable and socially inclusive. While looking specifically at the last research topic linking to extreme weather event and climate change, transdisciplinary research is needed to further knowledge of extreme weather and climate events on health, including injuries and illnesses, infectious diseases, emergence and spree, food security and mental health, and on healthcare institution, including the cost of impact. Also, research is needed to advance the practice of disaster risk management, preparedness, response, and communication, including through event forecasting and early warming system. Research is needed to understand the effectiveness of social safety nets for reducing vulnerability to extreme events and the effectiveness of adaptation strategies in reducing health risks, particularly in vulnerable communities and regions. We also need models to future health risks and potential loss and damage of critical health infrastructure, including economic and societal costs of disaster preparedness and response under the shared socioeconomic pathway. Next slide, please. Thank you so much, Capon. So coming to what can be done in strengthening climate resilient health systems. From the research, from a health perspective, we think that the research gap 
include a better understanding of approaches to prevention, prediction, and preparedness. We need research on early warming systems, pathway analysis of climate emissions from health care, economic analysis of the costs and benefit of transitions to climate smart health care. And of course, we need research on risk communication. Next slide, please. For monitoring, surveillance, and learning, four main specific, three main specific components were raised. Geographic information system tools can be used for vulnerability mapping and research is needed on that. Exploring appropriate ways of citizen participation in health monitoring may be also valuable. And we certainly need a result on that. And passive disease outbreak surveillance and reporting system can be also exploited and used with environmental and climate observation to access and monitor disease outbreak patterns and trends globally. Next, please. Thank you. For risk communications, there is a need for an effective and consistent strategy for communication and health promotion that increase the resilience of vulnerable communities and regions. Tailored communication tools are needed to meet the specific needs of different disadvantaged groups, such as migrant communities. And there is a research practice gap with respect to institutional change in the healthcare sector, including how to modify the pattern of knowledge practice and values that make up comprehensive healthcare. And last, more innovative interdisciplinary people-centered participatory research is needed to transform people's perception of risk and their risk reduction behavior and communication preventions. Last, please. And finally, the implementation of those research priorities need to be done with multiscalar approaches, with transdisciplinarity, with inclusivity and equality, and with broad communication and outreach. Next, please. Specifically for multiscalar approaches, understanding historical patterns of planetary health impact to establish causal relationship from the local to the global and projecting the possible magnitude and patterns of future risk under different development pathway is needed. Next, please. And for transdisciplinarity, we certainly need to invite stakeholders at each level to co-design research and implement interventions with our stakeholders' participation. Next, please. For inclusivity and equality, by being responsive to intersectoral aspects such as gender, age, social status, and ethnicity in how research is conducted and in how solutions are developed may certainly help achieve rapidly the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Next, please. And finally, we need a broad communication and outreach and sharing newly generated knowledge with different audiences. This include the dissemination beyond the academia and experimenting with creative communication approaches to inform policy development in adaptation and mitigation. And from the health care perspective, having done in such a way, we may most probably be able to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable 
development. Having said that, let's move to the Q&A discussion session. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you very much, um, Brahma, and thanks uh, uh, to all our speakers. Uh, as Brahma said, um, it's now time uh, for some Q&A, and uh, I might uh, encourage all our speakers to turn their uh, videos back on. And uh, uh, I noticed that there are a number of uh, 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 issues being raised in both the chat box and uh, in the Q&A, and we encourage others uh, also uh, to raise questions and, and make comments. I do notice um, a message there from um, Fumiko Kasuga in Japan. Uh, Fumiko, of course, um, uh, the director of the, the Future Earth uh, Global Hub for Japan and who's been a strong supporter of the work of the Future Earth Health Can uh, uh, since the, the inception. It's so great to have, uh, have you uh, with us today, Fumiko. Now, um, uh, perhaps uh, we should begin with um, uh, the uh, the question from um, Anne Helene, um, uh, where she's thanked um, our speakers for the presentations and noted that the agenda is broad um, uh, and um, uh, whether we might comment uh, on the main priorities um, uh, from the perspective of the CAN. The um, Brahma, uh, I see your hand up. Um, would you like to lead off? on that one. Yeah, thank you so much, Tony. I also followed the q and session and I, I saw this question of Hannah Len after the comment from Kay and the heads. And I guess the one I just made coming from the presentation from Shadia and from Frances, maybe this presentation we just presented right now uh, have been enough for the question raised by Anne Len, but anyway, we still available if additional comments are needed. This is what I can say from my side. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Brahma. And I, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, Chris, I can see your hand up as well, please. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the excellent question. As you can see, it did take folks from a lot of disciplines to put together this paper that no one of us can represent all of the issues that were covered. And we did not set priorities across these issues. All of them are important. It doesn't mean that every organization needs to address all of them directly but it does lead to a suggestion that in the spirit of future earth of thinking about how collaboratively these issues can be addressed and how to ensure during those collaborations from the different funders, from different research groups that all of the issues are covered. If you look at, for example, WCRP, that there is a real effort under the World Climate Research Program to make sure that all priorities are addressed without putting all the burden on a small number of groups for doing so. So thank you for that question. Uh, I might take us now uh, to the question raised by Franz Gatzweiler in the Q&A box. Um, uh, and maybe I'll just read this one out. Uh, uh, before we respond. So uh, Franz notes that um, adaptation and resilience strategies, um, for example, improved earth system monitoring, aim at increasing efficiency and pushing uh, the ecological boundaries back to increase uh, the human operating space. But these strategies do not change the fundamental mechanisms and values on the basis of which societies have operated and which caused the planetary health crisis uh, which we face today. Uh, what needs to be done for truly transformational change? Yeah. Uh, definitely a big uh, question here um, from Franz today. Uh, would any of our speakers uh, 
uh, like to respond to that. I'd, I'm happy to have a bit of a go and then perhaps um, uh, we can say, oh, Chris, I can see your hand up. Uh, would you like to jump in? And Francis as well, yeah. Well, at some point, I'd really like to turn this back to Franz because this is an area in which he works. And I would very much like to hear what his perspective is on this question. So without answering the question, I would like to hear from him as well. Yes, I'm not sure whether he can, he's, oh, he's just joined us. I can see he's there. So he might actually be able to, to jump in. Um, but uh, Francis, shall we go to you and then see if Franz can, can jump in uh, to add some more commentary, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I do think it's a very good question and it's a really challenging question. And I'm afraid I'm not going to say that I've got the answer, but I would say that there are growing conversations from a range of different organizations around the world, really questioning what is the future, potentially very much sparked by the COVID pandemic and both the, the fact that it's highlighted some of the existing problems and of course, highlighted the need for transformation in society. So certainly in the UK, we've got the Centre for Understanding Sustainable Prosperity, but there are other groups as well, really questioning um, what is it that we want for the future um, at, at this time when globally society has had to change and rethink what it does and what its values are. It's an opportunity to really get into the nitty gritty of that question. But I don't think anyone has got the answers. And certainly I can't answer that for you as a, as a direct, this is what we should be doing. But yes, I agree. It'd be interesting to hear what Franz would like to propose as well. Yes, uh, well, Franz, perhaps over to you. Would you like to uh, jump in at this point? Well, thank you, Tony. And thank you to all the speakers. I really love the presentations. And sorry for the question, which is a bit mean, I know. <laughs> um, I think what I, with the question, I want to draw our attention uh, to the um, to the uh, to the necessity. I think that we need to go one step further than talking about resilience and adaptation. And um, in the context of monitoring and measuring our impact on planet Earth, it is uh, as you all as you all mentioned it is important to include stakeholders, like uh, Brahma said, citizen science, uh, participatory approaches, but not because, the, uh, because of ideological uh, connotations, because of, that's because we like to do, we, we, um, we, we like to do that. And it's because this involvement of people in the process of monitoring and evaluation, that means, for example, collaborative modeling, is systemically relevant. So from a complexity understanding, we are not looking from outside the ecosystem onto the ecosystem, but we are part of the ecosystem. Um, and because of that, it's important to, um, to come to these collaborative approaches and because of that, we need to together, and this is, in, this is incredibly challenging if you look at the different cultural perspectives of the East and the West, for example, uh, we need to come to a consensus on, on values, on how we treat uh, the planet. Yeah, no, thanks um, very much, Franz. Uh, very helpful reflections. And, and just to note that um, uh, Franz was uh, uh, another of the co-authors of the paper uh, that was published recently. And um, uh, we thank all of the authors um, and contributors uh, to the paper. Chadia, did I see your hand up as well? Yes, um, I just would like to comment on the question that uh, we have to change our behavior uh, because we are the ones, uh, the human being on this earth causing this Anthropocene. So unless we change our behavior and we, we make our uh, way of living and how we produce and uh, our food and our energy sustainable um, uh, and uh, without doing harm to, to the nature, uh, we will not succeed uh, uh, in, in achieving our uh, goals. Yeah, this is a very important uh, 
point, Charlie, and perhaps to add to that, that um, uh, fundamentally, I think one of our conclusions um, from the Lancet Planetary Health Commission that uh, Richard Horton, uh, editor of the Lancet, highlighted um, uh, in his editorial uh, when that was published some years back. Uh, and uh, Richard referred to the work of the eminent uh, human ecologist Stephen Boyden and uh, noted that uh, human culture is actually the problem. And, uh, but importantly, the only hope for the future is to change that culture, as you say, uh, Chadia. So uh, we need a culture change, a change of mindset, uh, so that we strive for ways of living uh, that are in tune with and sensitive to uh, the health needs of natural systems, not just the health needs of people. And uh, this is a fundamental shift because most of our focus is on uh, the health and well-being of people. And we see this very clearly, of course, um, during the pandemic. The, the public health measures uh, to protect health during the pandemic are enormously important, but we always need to remember uh, that our health entirely depends on the health of natural systems. And that's, that's a fundamental part um, of uh, uh, the effort uh, that we're making in the health can. Um, now I can see a couple more um, uh, uh, comments uh, in, uh, in, in the chat box. And maybe while I, I look at those, um, uh, the, um, I might also note uh, an earlier comment from um, uh, Kevin Bell, uh, Professor Kevin Bell about human rights. Um, in this context, and uh, it's earlier in the chat box. I think you'll, you'll see it if you scroll back. And I think this is very important because, um, you know, when we talk about human rights in relation to health, we often focus um, on the right to health care and important issues um, uh, like reproductive uh, rights. These are very important questions, but we sometimes overlook the right to a healthy environment. And, uh, and this approach is starting to get some prominence um, uh, with uh, the work of the UN Special Rapporteur uh, on um, uh, uh, David Boyd, who's encouraging a stronger focus on uh, uh, the right to a healthy environment. And this very much aligns um, with the kind of work um, uh, we're doing in the health can, understanding uh, that uh, there's a human rights dimension to this that's not um, the classical um, human rights dimension of human health. And it's really now acknowledging this Anthropocene and the fact uh, uh, that we, we need to focus more on the right to a healthy environment. So thanks very much uh, for raising uh, that, Kevin, uh, as well. Um, now, um, let me see, I can see it, um, uh, something from Permanita. Um, even as we understand transitions in a global framing, what would be your suggestions on taking forward the discussion to make transitions effective in specific uh, uh, regions? I, th I think this is very important that uh, uh, all of this work is very context dependent. And I wonder if, uh, if our panelists um, might like to speak to the differing contexts in different regions of the world. Uh, Chris. Thank you, Tony. I was just starting to write a response to Pernamisa. So um, I'll, I'll read what I started writing in the chat. We do have a series of global goals, but the cultural and social context is critically important for how we move forward and the speed with which we move forward and the priorities we place on the transitions. And this paper, of course, as an author, you well understand, is a global picture. And that underneath this, there needs to be regional efforts. That what is decided in terms of priorities from this particular agenda 
for Asia is likely to be different than what is gonna happen in Africa, for example. And that's how it should be. And how can we, as part of the future Earth community, help support those regional efforts, bringing in that rich context so that people have the information so that they can move forward on those transitions within their own particular context. Uh, thanks uh, very much for those reflections, uh, Chris. Any other comments um, from different regional perspectives on the the importance of context in relation to transition? Certainly, um, one of the big issues, of course, is the need um, uh, to contract consumption in high-income countries like um, where I live uh, in Australia, for example, uh, to um, uh, reduce the environmental footprint uh, per capita uh, in countries like ours to make room for further development, sustainable development in other countries. Uh, I think the whole question of um, uh, sharing the resources of the earth fairly uh, among the people of the world uh, is critically uh, important. The, um, now I, I also, oh, Brahma, please. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Maybe just a few comments from uh, the transition issue in specific regions. Uh, coming from a developing country, um, the perspective I will share is certainly linking to this uh, kind of countries. And I think there is a real need for strong advocacy for decision makers. Because in fact, decision makers are challenging, building, getting jobs for the communities and having industries that are considering a transition to new production systems, new environmental friendly production systems. And generally what is observed is when a private sector is coming, they need to discuss with local decision makers on the production tools that will be needed and of course, there is a need to agree on the last production tools. However, generally, a commitment is made for using less environmental friendly production systems and with the promise of improving these systems in coming years. And unfortunately, when the production system started, and when jobs are created for communities, it becomes now difficult to make those entities respect the promise made at the beginning. So there is really a strong advocacy to make at political level in order to help implement, observe some of those transition issues, mainly looking at the last production tools, industrial production tools. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Brahman. I can see an, a number of active chats there in, in the chat box, and that's terrific to see. And perhaps I'm conscious of time as the, the moderator and um, uh, to make sure that Chris has a, a few minutes for some uh, final reflections as, um, as co-chair. Uh, of the Health Knowledge Action Network. I'd just like to move us back over to the Q&A box. Uh, a couple of issues raised there. Um, one um, around this question of um, uh, the value of a term like the capitalist scene. I think, um, I, I think this is an interesting um, uh, concept and uh, in some ways, um, uh, a more specific uh, concept uh, than the Anthropocene. The, the Anthropocene, of course, um, uh, our Earth science colleagues arguing that we've entered uh, this new geological epoch in which um, humans are now changing Earth systems to such an extent that we'll see it in the fossil record. 
and the the idea of the capital is seen, I think, giving a, a sharper edge uh, to the important economic uh, dimensions um, of these changes, and uh, and I think we have highlighted this these today, and so so I think um, a range of terms um, can be useful. I recall um, uh, some time back hearing the term the Anglicene as well, which um, uh, sheets it more directly home to the English speaking people of the world, uh, like myself and Chris and others. Um, and then, you know, there is um, uh, there's, uh, there's some argument there as well that, um, you know, maybe uh, the cultures um, in uh, uh, some English speaking countries are, are actually um, an important part of the challenge, but perhaps that's um, something that we should uh, think about for the future. But, uh, and also perhaps uh, some final reflections just in regard to Bob's Webb's um, uh, issue there, very important one. Uh, in summary, Bob, um, raising the fact that, uh, you know, we have to be careful in this kind of work uh, to, um, to try and maintain the, the, the sharp focus um, on health. It's always a balance, um, you know, because other, this could become, uh, uh, if you like, um, a, a process thinking about the full sustainable development lens. But I think we did our best to get, navigate a path where we were uh, highlighting in particular issues um, uh, that that we see as priorities for human health and well-being, as Andy Haynes pointed out um, on his video. While one of the SDGs, SDG three, is very specifically um, uh, focused on the health system perspective, if you like, uh, then um, it's important to remember that the other sixteen uh, are all determinants of health, whether they're um, uh, environmental determinants, social determinants, or economic determinants. And I think I really like the way WHO uh, represents um, uh, the SDGs with SDG three in the middle and all of the other 16 around uh, the outside, if you like, as a platter almost. And that I think very clearly illustrates uh, that uh, uh, all of the other SDGs uh, have a relevance to health. But I think I'd better stop there, Chris, and pass back to you as co-chair uh, for some closing remarks. So, so thanks, everybody. Well, thank you very much, Tony, and thanks to the panelists, and thanks to all the attendees who joined, those who came to listen in, and those who contributed to the paper that we really appreciate all of the efforts everyone has put into identifying this research agenda. We appreciate very much your interest in it. We encourage you to take a look at the paper, which has obviously a lot more detail than we're able to get into in the last few minutes. And please do feel free to follow up with any of us. If you've got further questions, we'd always be happy to answer your questions. So I do wanna end on time. And I do want to thank everybody very much for this event. And most of all, at this moment, I'd like to thank Jill for putting this event together. He's got himself with his video off, but there you are. Thank you very much, Jill. We would not be here without everything that you've done. So it's been remarkable how well you've pulled all of us together. Again, thank you, everybody. This has really been an exceptionally interesting event and we look forward to engaging with all of you in future Earth activities and for those of you in health and the Future Earth Health Knowledge Action Network. And from Seattle, Washington, good night. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> thank you.